Hi everyone, Dr. Aulis here. In this short video, we're going to talk about the process of active transport, which is a way that cells can move things in or out using energy. A quick reminder for us that when we talk about the plasma membrane of a cell, we have what's called the resting membrane potential. This means that inside and outside of our cell membranes, we actually see differences in the, the concentration of charges, as well as the chemicals that are found on either side of the membrane. For us to have these differences, we're going to have to have the ability to move things up their concentration gradient, meaning we're taking things from where there's not a lot of them to a place where there's already a lot of them. So we use energy or active transport to, to create the resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential isn't the only thing we use active transport for, but it's one of the most important things that we do it for. So active transport in general is something that is going to require energy. There are two kind of different forms of energy that we use. So those help us to define a couple of our types of active transport. The first kind of energy that we can use is ATP, which is our cell's energy money. If we're using our cell's energy money, ATP, to do the process of, of moving things, doing active transport, we call that primary active transport. We can also do what I like to think about as piggybacking. So in secondary active transport, one molecule is moving down its concentration gradient, which allows another molecule to move up its concentration gradient. One other kind of active transport process that doesn't move things in exactly the same way, but still requires energy is called vesicular transport. And in vesicular transport, we're going to use vesicles, which are little membrane bubbles or membrane sacs, to move things into or out of the cell. So let's talk about these types of active transport one by one. The first kind of active transport is primary active transport. And as you're studying primary active transport, I want you to underline, highlight, star, make a note that ATP is directly involved in this. So for us to move things with primary active transport, I must have ATP present. The other thing that we want to underline, highlight, star with primary active transport is that I'm moving two things, both of them up. If two things are going uphill, I can't do piggybacking where one goes uphill while the other one goes down. I'm moving two things up their concentration gradient. One of the best examples of primary active transport is what we call the sodium potassium pump. In the sodium potassium pump, we have to remember that our cells are salty bananas, meaning I've got a whole lot of sodium outside and a whole lot of potassium inside. Well, the sodium potassium pump is what gets us to that place where there's a lot of sodium outside and a lot of potassium inside. So why we have to use ATP for the sodium potassium pump is because this pushes sodium outside where there's already a lot of sodium. And this brings potassium into the cell where there's already a lot of potassium. The reason that my cell is doing this is to build that resting membrane potential that we talked about before. I know I already put this in bold in your notes, but again, I need you to underline, highlight, star this. If a cell uses energy to do something, it must be important. Your cells are really good at only spending their energy money on things that they actually need. Unlike Dr. Aulis, who has an Amazon addiction and buys things I don't need with my money, if I were a cell, I would only spend my energy money on necessities. And what makes primary active transport a necessity, why I have to do the sodium potassium pump, is to generate that resting membrane potential that we've talked about. So let's explore resting membrane potential a little bit more to figure out why it's worth spending energy money on. Resting membrane potential, if you recall, the normal charge on your cells is negative 70 millivolts, which means that inside my cells, it's 70 millivolts more negative than it is on the outside of my cells. 
There's several different things that make this difference negative, negative 70. The first thing that makes it different is for every time that I run the sodium potassium pump, I put three positives outside, but only bring one positive inside. I'm going into the negative every single time I push out sodiums and bring in potassiums. I also have a lot of proteins inside my cell that are negatively charged. Negatively charged proteins plus that loss of a positive charge every time the pump runs makes me have a negative charge. We have to have a resting membrane potential on our cells for a variety of reasons. And actually all the cells in your body have a resting membrane potential. This is because resting membrane potential is critical to functions. Functions like allowing neurons to talk to each other, functions like enabling your muscles to contract. Our kidney cells require that we have these differences in charge for them to be able to filter things. And we also use the resting membrane potential to power the process of secondary active transport. So another form of active transport that we're getting ready to explore, we have to have started with a difference in charge to be able to do this kind of transport. So let's talk about secondary active transport. Secondary active transport is the one that I like to say we're piggybacking, meaning that one thing is going to move up its concentration gradient while another thing moves down. Because that thing that's moving down so badly wants to go downhill, it's willing to let somebody else go uphill as it moves. To make this make a little bit more sense, let's look at a specific example of secondary active transport. And this example is what's called the sodium glucose co-transporter. In the sodium glucose co-transporter, we're moving both sodium and glucose. So if we're thinking about these two molecules, one of them moving uphill, one of them moving downhill, we, we look at the two things we're moving to determine which is which. Sodium is moving downhill in the sodium glucose co-transporter in that my sodium ions, which I just made a whole bunch of them on the outside, are actually gonna sneak back inside with the sodium glucose co-transporter. At the same time, while I'm moving those sodiums on the inside, glucose also gets to sneak inside this transporter. We already have a lot of glucose inside our cells. Glucose is our cell's favorite food, so we have a lot in there, but if I use the sodium glucose co-transporter, I can bring even more inside. Hey, remember our statement from before that if a cell uses energy for something, even the energy of, of one molecule going downhill while the other one goes up, that must be important. And when we talk about the sodium glucose co-transporter, what's so important that we're willing to spend our energy money on is feeding the cell. This is the way that the cell brings in the glucose that it needs to, to make the energy that it requires. The sodium glucose co-transporter, by the way, is an example of a symporter. A symporter is something that brings two things in in the same direction. It is possible to have what's called an anti-porter, where one thing would be going downhill, which allows another thing to go uphill in the opposite direction. So symporters, two things move the same way. Anti-porters, they move opposite ways. What we saw with the sodium potassium pump, that was an antiporter. What we're seeing here with this sodium glucose co-transporter is a symporter. The one other way that I move things into or out of my cells that requires energy is called vesicular transport. And when we talk about vesicular transport, we're talking about using vesicles, which are just little places, little sacs of the plasma membrane that wrap around things and bring them in. Let's underline highlight star that vesicular transport is what I use for things that are large. So things that couldn't come through a symporter or an antiporter, I'm going to have to use a vesicle to bring them in or to spit them out.
We can do vesicular transport in several different ways, and it depends a lot on what it is we're transporting. If I'm bringing something into the cell, I would do what's called endocytosis. Endo means inside, so endocytosis is what I see in my picture over here, bringing things into the cell using a membrane bubble. I can take things out of the cell. That's called exocytosis. So in exocytosis, I've got a, a bubble, I've got a vesicle that I take to the surface of my membrane and use it to release things into the environment. But sometimes I will take a, use a vesicle to transport things from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell. We'll do this a lot, for example, in the uh, urinary system or in the digestive system. We grab something from one side and carry it all the way to the other side to get it into the bloodstream or to get it into the urine. I do also use vesicles to move things around inside my cell quite a bit. So if I make a protein at the rough endoplasmic reticulum, I'd use the Golgi apparatus to wrap it in a vesicle and send it where it needs to go, either in the cell or out of the cell. So lots of different things that I can do when I use these membrane sacs. Briefly, let's chat about a couple, the two, the two big ones, endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis is when things come into my cell. There are different kinds of things that I can bring inside. So for example, if I'm bringing in something that's very large and that is a solid, like an old red blood cell that's dying, bringing in something like that, I would call phagocytosis. So if I'm eating something large, like an old red blood cell, or this is how we deal with viruses or bacteria, I use phagocytosis to eat or to bring in large solid things. Maybe I'm just trying to get a bunch of the fluid from my environment because it has things inside of it. If that's the case, I would do what's called penocytosis. Penocytosis is when I grab fluid from the environment, make a bubble around it. Now that bubble is called a vesicle and that fluid can be, and its contents can be placed inside my cell. Sometimes though, I don't want just all the fluid from my environment. Sometimes there are very particular things in that fluid that I wanna grab. And if that's the case, I'm gonna use receptor mediated endocytosis, allowing me to only grab particular things with my receptors. Receptor mediated endocytosis is very specific, whereas penocytosis is a lot more general. So these are those three main ways that I bring things into my cell. In exocytosis, I'm putting things out of my cell. When I do exocytosis, I'm typically spitting out something like a neurotransmitter to allow one neuron to talk to another or to allow a neuron to talk to a muscle cell. Exocytosis is also the way that your endocrine system spits out hormones. When we do exocytosis, we create a bubble around whatever it is we're spitting out. That bubble goes to the surface, the inner surface of the plasma membrane, and then we'll attach it to some proteins on the surface of the plasma membrane, which allow it to fuse with that membrane and spit those contents out into the external environment. When we do exocytosis, it's typically caused by, or it's typically started, because something happened with our membrane charge or a membrane potential. So as we'll talk about with neuron signaling, when the charge inside my neuron gets all the way up to positive 30 millivolts, it's completely flipped from negative to positive. When I get to that point, my vesicles that have neurotransmitters will go to the plasma membrane on a neuron and spit those neurotransmitters out. So we're not always doing exocytosis. We typically need something like a membrane charge change uh, or for example, receiving another message that tells us we need to spit out our message. Those are the only times I would do exocytosis when I know I'm supposed to release something. This is a nice overview for us of the differences between exocytosis and endocytosis.
We see over here on the right a detailed step-by-step -step the process that we use to release neurotransmitters. Uh, so this is an example of exocytosis on the right. And over here on the left, we can see endocytosis where things from the environment come into my cell. As they're in my cell, we figure out what to do with them. Either we'll break them down with a lysosome because they're garbage or they're harmful to us, or perhaps we'll use them to do something, or we'll spit them back out on the other side. Ultimately, we end up with an empty vesicle that we can use to grab something else, or we can just put back into the plasma membrane so that I can grab something later if there's not something now. You have this, this transport activity uh, to practice. You had it a little bit earlier in your slides than I'm hitting it now, but I think you should add to your list of transport processes endocytosis and exocytosis as well because we can compare those processes to each other just as we can compare these other processes listed here. So you see some active transport, you see some passive transport. Use your notes, use the videos to help you sort out our types of transport with the statements that best describe them.